Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Now, when it comes to preaching and churches, there's very little preaching on the Song of Solomon. I don't know if you've known that. In fact, I was once advised, don't preach on the Song of Solomon. Like, that's not the book that you should be preaching in church. In fact, that's a book that's really intimate between the husband and the wife. And yes, it is a book that's very, very intimate about the marriage relationship. We've been going through the series on the family. We've been going through the series on the family. I've preached on husbands. I've preached on wives. But I've not preached on marriage itself. Okay, just the marriage union between the two. And if you look at Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 11, have a look at this. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 11. I believe verse 11 here is the, is the key verse to the whole book of Song of Solomon. The key theme to the entire book of the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. Now, just, uh, just see who knows the answer to this. If, if it's saying here, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, what season are we dealing with? Spring, spring right? Springtime. All right. So the title for the sermon tonight is Springtime Marriage. Springtime Marriage. We start off there with the, the, the claim that winter is over. And now we're in a new season. We're in the season of spring. The rain is over and gone. All right. The sorrows are gone. The, 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 the dark clouds are gone. And, and things are being fruitful. Things are being productive. In springtime is when the leaves start to grow back on the plants, aren't they? In springtime is when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the uh, insects start getting busy and they, they start to pollinate. The bees start to pollinate and other creatures... You know, that's where you start seeing, you know, the birds, you know, constructing nests and and, uh, there's a lot more activity in nature. And then we have the fruit that comes off the trees. And this is springtime. Quite often when you've gone through winter, we're in spring now, aren't we, the season? You've gone through the cold, you've gone through the rain. You're kind of, ah, I want to get back to that. You're looking forward to spring, right? You know, and a lot of people don't like summer because summer's like really hot. And spring's just that nice in between. You know, you've got some of those cooler days, you've got some of those warmer days. And so I believe the, the theme of the Song of Solomon is for us to have a springtime marriage all the time. Okay, springtime marriage all the time. Not like the seasons we have here where we go through different seasons because of, of the way, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the, the, uh, the natural world works. No, but in your marriage, you can stay in one season all the time. And the season we want to be in is springtime, springtime marriage. So I'll be preaching about marriage and the, and the lessons we can get here from the Song of Solomon. And I've got, I believe, let's have a look, I've got 14 points. I've got 14 points. They're all very quick points to get through. 14 points that will help your marriage become a springtime marriage. Now, maybe there are some of these things in this list that you're already doing. Praise God. In fact, I could have come up with many more things. If you read the Song of Solomon, I personally believe husbands and wives should read the book of Song of Solomon together in order to continue knowing what you know, God expects from a marriage, to see you know, the love that comes out of God's word between that marriage union. And I believe this book can strengthen your marriage. So just a few points, or quite a lot of points, uh, but quick points that I believe will help your marriage. Okay, go to Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse uh, two, please. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse two. Uh, all right. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse two, and look how it begins. It says, "Let him," and this is the wife speaking. I should give you a bit of introduction. The Song of Solomon is a song. The Bible also calls it the Song of Songs, and I believe it's called the Song of Songs because it's probably the best song of all the songs that Solomon wrote. The Song of Songs, the one that stands out the most, the one that's actually also written by inspiration of God and has been canonized for us in the Bible. And so this song is a song between husbands and wives. The wives singing to their husbands. The husband singing to his wife. And this is what she says in verse number two. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. What's the first thing we see there in a married couple? We see that this married couple is having physical affection. Point number one for you to have a springtime marriage is for you to show physical affection between husband and wife. Okay? Physical affection, kisses, hugs, you know, show affection toward one another. And I believe this is so important for the children that grow up in that family home. 
to see mum and dad have that physical, you know, uh, you know some, some affection. You know, as a child, now I wouldn't ask my parents to do this today, right? But as a child, I would, I would go to my dad and say, dad, kiss mum, right? Or mum, kiss dad. You know, you say, why? Because as a child, when I saw my parents kiss, when I saw that they loved one another, it gave me security. It said, wow, my parents love each other, right? My parents love each other. They're not going to get divorced. They're not fighting. You know, I can have stability in this family. I can see what it means to be a husband and wife. And I don't believe parents, you should hide that kind of affection from your children. You say, why? Because your children are going to grow up. You know, they're going to turn on that TV and they're going to see physical affection ungodly physical affection on television. They're going to see ungodly physical affection out in the world. They're going to see, you know, uh, uh, you know, just, just, you know, people taking what should belong in marriage and just abusing that outside of the marriage union. And so where do you want your kids to learn, you know, where physical affection needs to be done? They want to learn it from mum and dad. They want to see that in the family home so they grow up knowing, okay, I've got to save myself for my wife. I've got to save myself for my husband, not for some boyfriend that's going to use me and abuse me, not for some girlfriend that's sleeping around and, and wasting her life. No, if, if we show our children that physical affection, they're going to understand the right place, the right context that needs to be within. Okay, and that is within marriage. And so, you know, if, you know, we, we, you know we, we, when you first get married, right, you have the honeymoon period, I'm sure, you know, even when you get married, you know, you may kiss your bride. Right? And it's that kind of that first kiss there, you know, as, as, as officially as husband and wife, and everyone claps and, woo, you know, husband and wife kissing. But then you get five years into marriage, you get 10 years into marriage, you get 15 years into marriage, and sometimes this affection drops away. You know, sometimes you, you may not even remember the last time you gave some physical affection to your wife or to your husband. You know, and, and if that's happening, you've lost the springtime. You've lost the springtime. You need to bring springtime back into your marriage. And you do that, number one, by showing physical affection toward one another. Look at verse number three now. Song of Solomon chapter one, verse three. It says, Because of the savour of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, therefore do the virgins love thee. Okay, this is again the wife speaking to her husband. And what does she say about him? That he's got the savour of good ointments. Now, men, you know, I, I know we have this idea of what it means to be manly, right? And, and some people, you know, some husbands, you work hard. You know, let's say you're a bricklayer, you know, you're, 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 a, you're a laborer. You know, you work some tough work, you're out there in the, in the hot sun, you're sweating, you're smelly, you're muddy, right? You come home and you're like, whatever, you know, let the whole house stink. Who cares? This is my manliness. No, you know, that's not how you ought to be. You know, here we see that the husband smelt good for his wife. He put on the ointments. Now, I'm not saying he put on, you know, the, the, the creams and, you know, he plucked his eyebrows and became a metrosexual, you know, man of, of this time. No, but he did what he could to at least smell well for his wife. And quite often as you read the Song of Solomon, you see the same thing come up all the time. The way that they smell, you know, to one another. And obviously he's putting on some good ointments. What does that mean? He's putting on some perfume. He's putting on a bit of deodorant, right? When he comes home from work or whatever he's doing, he wants to make sure he presents himself for his wife. For his wife to go, wow, look at my husband. You know, and, and you ought to do that, man. You ought to put on a little bit of a show for your wife. Listen, when you tried to get her hand in marriage, when you wanted to date her and you wanted to attract her, didn't you clean yourself up? Didn't you make sure your, your clothing was at least ironed? Didn't you make sure, you know, you, you were putting on fresh clothing? Didn't you put a little bit of deodorant and a little bit of perfume on? Of course you did, right? And that's what you do at the beginning. But again, you go through the five years, the ten years, like, ah, oh, whatever. You know, <laughs> just put up with my smell. No, that's not the right way. That's not the springtime. You're losing the springtime when you're that way. You know, always make sure that you're seeking to put a good presentation forward for your wife. Listen, you come to church... You come well dressed. You come looking good. I'm sure you've maybe put a bit of perfume on here and there. You go to work in the morning. You wash your face. You might comb your hair. You put on a fresh pair of cl clothing on. You're out there at work. Well, you know what's more important than, than your workplace and your colleagues? Your wife. You know what's more important? Your husband. That's who you're spending the rest of your life with. You know, make sure that you put a little bit of effort to show that, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to be presentable to you as well. You know, even when you come home hot and sweaty, you know, go have that shower, put on a fresh pair of clothes, 
Go spend time with your wife. Smell good. Point number one was show physical affection. Point number two was smell good. You know, it's a bit of a joke, but it's there in the Bible, right? It's there for, for a purpose because I know what men are like, right? I, I'm one, right? I know, and this is something that I tend to forget sometimes. Let's get to the third point. Look at verse number five. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse five. Now, before I read this, before I read this, isn't it true that ladies, and if you're a lady and you say, no, this is not true, ah, at least other women that you know, right? They're always thinking about their appearance, right? I mean, a, a girl that has straight hair, she wants wavy hair, right? And the girl that has wavy hair, she wants straight hair, right? The, the girl that has blonde hair wants darker hair. And the girl that has darker hair wants lighter hair. Okay, it seems like they're never satisfied, you know, with, with their appearance, right? And we see this play out in this book as well, okay? And, and husbands, something you need to understand, and this is why it's in the Bible here, is the person that's going to be the most critical about your wife's appearance is herself. Is herself. Okay, so look at this. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 5. Look what she says here. Verse number 5, she says, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Now she's black. Now before we keep reading, um, she's not saying that she's got dark skin. Okay. Well, as we read on, she, she's talking about being dark because she's been tanned by the sun. Okay. She's been out working um, in the vineyard, you'll soon see. And, and because she's been in the sun, she's been darkened. Right. And again, this is society. We, certain so the times, society we live in. Now I'm on the Sunshine Coast. I'm with a lot of Anglo-Saxon, you know, a lot of white, you know, Australians out there. And you know what they want to do in summer, in springtime and summer? They want to be darker, right? They want to get in the, in the sun. They want to tan their bodies or put on those fake tans. They want to be darker. But you know what other places in the world want to do, like India? They want to be whiter. Right? And some of these, some of the, I, I saw some documentary in India that these girls are trying to put things on their skin to be whiter. Okay, and so, like I said, it, it, there's always this criticism about the way, you, you know, these ladies look at, about themselves. Look at verse number six. She says to Solomon, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun have looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So she says, look, and I don't believe her mother's children, her siblings are angry at her. It's just that she's doing the family business. She's, she's looking after the family vineyard. She's out at work and she's saying, you know, my family's angry at me. That's why they put me to work. Not, not, you know, obviously she's working because that's what, ne that's what needed there for the family. And while she was there, she got a little darker. She got a little tanned by the sun. And I guess when we take this context, she's someone that doesn't want to look darker, right? She's someone that's worried about her skin color. And that's why she says at the beginning, look not upon me because I am black. And she says, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So she's been busy working and she's not had time to look after her own appearance, her own vineyard. That, that's what the, um, you know, the illustration is there. And uh, look, look at verse number seven. If you can verse, turn to the verse number seven. Verse number seven. It says here, tell me, O thou, when my soul, uh, sorry. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Now, this is now the husband speaking to the wife. The wife has just finished saying, don't look at me. You know, I don't look good. I'm, I'm, I've gotten darkened by the sun. But look how, how he responds to her. Verse number eight. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. So how does the husband respond? Wife is like, don't look at me. I don't look good. Right? Don't look at me. I've got a pimple. Don't look at me. My hair's not done properly this morning. Whatever. You know, I don't know. Well, what does your wife say? I don't know. Right? And well, how does he respond to her in verse number eight? If thou know not, O oh thou fairest among women. He says, wife, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. You're the fairest of them all, he says, right? And husbands, that's how you respond to your wife when she's being critical about her appearance. You married her. 
You must have been physically attracted. You must have looked at her and said, this is a beautiful woman. This is a woman that I can love. I, can, I, you know, I can't take my eyes off her. Hey, if that's the woman you married, make sure she feels that way day by day. She needs to be told that she's the fairest of them all. She needs to be told that she's the most beautiful woman. And that's the response that we see here in the Bible. Not only that, look at verse number nine. He says, I have compared thee. So he's, she's, she's trying to make her feel really good about herself. She goes, I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now, I don't fully understand that. So obviously, Egypt at that point in time was a powerful nation. And Pharaoh had a powerful army. And he's got these chariots with his horses. And I guess these chariots and horses represent their power, represent, you know, the prestige, the riches of Egypt. And he says to his wife, you're like that, honey. You know, you, 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 you know, you have high prestige. You have great value in my eyes. You know, you're the most important person to me in the world, the way, you know, the, 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 uh, the nation of Egypt was in those days. And so what we see here, point number three, if I can summarize this very quickly, point number three, in order for you to have a springtime marriage, is that men, you compliment your wife's appearance. You say, oh, I already told her 10 years ago that she's beautiful. Hey, tell her now. Tell her today. Tell her this week. Tell her next month. She needs to hear it again and again because as we saw, our wives are going to be the most critical about their appearance. They need to know that my husband loves me. They need to know that my husband still finds me attractive. My husband still finds me beautiful, more than the other women that are out there in the world. You know, once you said, I do, that's your wife for life. Okay? You don't set your eyes on any other woman. No, your wife has to be the fairest among women. You've got to set that in your heart. You've got to set that in your eyes. And so we see, uh, we don't only see the husband complimenting the wife. If you go to Song of Solomon chapter 4, Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse 7, go to chapter 4, Song of Solomon chapter 4 verse 7, the wife says this to, her, to the husband as well. She says, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. That's the wife, if you, if you look at the context, that's the wife speaking to the husband. He, she says to him, Thou art all fair. You know what else? Not only do men need to tell their wives how beautiful they are, wives, you need to tell your husbands from time to time how handsome they are. Okay? Now all the men, they know, yeah, of course I know I'm handsome. No, no, I'm just kidding. You know, but wives, you know, your husband need to hear that. You know, you know and if husbands, you're doing the best you can to attract your wife, to, 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 you know, present yourself as best as you can, these will be beautiful words to hear from your wife. She says, there is no spot in thee. Hey, that's pretty good. I know I've got plenty of spots. I've got plenty of scars. I've got plenty of things that my wife can look at. Hey, but if she's blinded by love, right, she's going to compliment the appearance. That's what it means to have a springtime marriage. And here's the truth. You know, when you married your wife, she was probably the most beautiful woman you ever saw. When you married your husband, oh, he's the most rugged, handsome man that I've ever seen in my life. But as the years go on, we change. Our appearances change. As the years go on, my stomach's gotten a bit bigger. I'm trying to work on that right now, right? As the years go by, we start getting the wrinkles. We start getting whatever, you know, um, wives fall pregnant, have children, bodies change, and those things happen. But the key thing is we want to stay in springtime. We want to stay in the right season, and so we must continue complimenting one another's appearance. That's what we get here from the Song of Solomon. Let's go to point number four and uh, go back to chapter one, Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 10. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 10. And what I'm about to say here might be contrary to other IFB churches that, or other pastors that preach. Okay? I've heard it said that women should never wear any jewelry. I've heard it said by some pastors, you know, Baptist pastors that, you know, it's wrong for women to wear jewelry, okay? And we'll look at this very shortly, but look at Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 10. Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 10. This is again the husband speaking about how beautiful his wife is. He says, thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold and studs of silver. What's my point number four? Point number four, in order for you to have a springtime marriage, is buy some jewelry for your wife. You know, buy her a gift from time to time. Now, here's the thing. I know jewelry is really expensive. You know, gold's, gold's gone up in price. You know, if you're getting some good quality stuff, it's very, very expensive. But from time to time, 
those special occasions, from time to time when your wife needs to be lifted up and, and cherished, you know, there's nothing wrong with you going out there and buying her a gift. There's nothing wrong with you getting out there and buying her some jewelry, okay? It, she'll, she'll love it, right? She'll love it. We see, we see biblical principles here where it, it's, it's okay for, for you to buy uh, some jewelry for your wife. You know, um, even God, I think it's in the book of Jeremiah, describes uh, Judah, uh, you know, and of course he's using illustrative language, but he says, you know, he, he cleaned up Judah, you know, he put jewelry on, on her, as it were, as a nation. And we, so, so um, what, my point is that throughout the Bible, we see the use of jewelry over and over again, you know, used for godly purposes. There's nothing wrong with, with, these, with these metals that God has created. You know, people find gold very beautiful because of its color. Nothing wrong with that being on your wife. You know, you know, adding to her beauty. And if you guys can take your Bible, stay in Song of Solomon, but go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. And I'll, I'll just show you where people take this view that, you know, buying jewelry or wearing jewelry is ungodly. So it's in 2 Timothy chapter, sorry, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 reads, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now look at this. Not with broidered hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness and good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. And of course, this is teaching about the woman's behavior in the church. You know, the Bible is making it very clear here that women are not given the permission by God to preach, to teach in the church. All right. But going back on that, he speaks about what the women, what, what you know, ladies, if you're here, what you should be aiming for when it comes to your character, the character about yourself. And it said there, to uh, verse number nine, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, and of course, the word modest there is talking about clothing that does not draw attention to you. You know, uh, you know what I'm talking about. You know, some women will dress in a certain way, you know, with their short skirts or revealing tops to draw attention from men. That's not how godly women should dress themselves. They ought to dress in a modest way with modest apparel, something that does not draw attention to yourself. Um, and then it, it keeps going there in verse number... Uh, um, Sorry, yeah, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So they'll read those passages about the gold and the pearls, costly array, and say, see, women are not permitted to wear jewelry. No, you're misunderstanding the points. It's the women that put on the jewelry, that put on the costly array, that are seeking to draw attention for themselves. That's what's ungodly. It's when you're going out of your way to draw attention to yourself. But the fact, you know, and it's comparing to your modest character, your shamefacedness, your sobriety. Those are the qualities that women are ought to have beyond the way you dress, beyond what you wear. And so it's not saying it's wrong to wear jewelry. It's that that's not what should make you as a person. What should make you as a person is the inner man, is your character. And so that's why some people take that. And, but then, you know, if you take that as it is like that and you think, oh, gold's always wrong, jewelry's always wrong, you're going to have major problems in the Bible. You're just, you know, as you're reading through the Bible, you're just going to have major conflicts because you'll see time and time again, godly men or even God using the illustration of jewelry and these kinds of things. Just as we saw there in the Song of Solomon. So point number four to have a springtime marriage is buy her jewelry, buy her gifts, make her feel special, make her feel beautiful. All right, point number six. Let's go to point number six. Back to Song of Solomon, chapter one. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 16, please. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 16. The Bible says here, Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. Also, our bed is green. Now, obviously, we've got kids here. I don't want to get too you know, uh, intimate with the details here. But do you think the bed they're sleeping in is actually green in color? Do you think they've got green sheets and green pillows and that's what, what they're referring to? Okay, think about this. If the theme of Song of Solomon is a springtime marriage, what happens during springtime? Now it's springtime right now, 
You know, I've got a granny flat in Bonnerig. My dad gets there once in a while and cuts the grass because the grass grows like wild, grows wild, right? During springtime, there's a lot more green, all right? In springtime, that's, that shows the productivity. The green shows the growth is what I'm trying to say. The growth, the fruitfulness of the season and how vegetation responds to the change of seasons. If we take that as the theme of the Song of Solomon and they're looking at their bed and they say the bed is green, what are they talking about? They're talking about the physical intimacy, right? Point number five there, in order for you to have a, a springtime marriage, is to have a fruitful marriage bed. That your marriage bed ought to be green. It ought to be productive. That physical intimacy between husband and wife should be there at all points of marriage. You know, and again, this is something that, you know, when you newly get married, this is something that, you know, it happens well, you know. And then, the, again, the years go by, the, you know, the time goes by, and people are less intimate with one another. You know, husbands are less intimate with their wives and vice versa. That shouldn't be the case. We're, tr- we're aiming for the springtime marriage all the time. And as they look at their marriage, but they see it as green. They see it as productive. They see it as fruitful. The fruit of the womb is his reward, the Bible says. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And it's interesting that it uses the term for children as fruit. As fruit. Why is it fruit? Because it came from green pastures, right? It came from, from, from growth. It came from productivity. It came from intimacy between husband and wife. And so point number six is have a fruitful marriage bed. I'll go through the six points so far that we've read. Point number one was to show some physical affection. Number two is smell good for one another. Point number three is compliment her appearance or compliment his appearance. Point number four is buy her jewelry. And point, actually this is point number five. Sorry, my numbering system is all wrong. Have a fruitful marriage bed. Have a fruitful marriage bed. If I give you the wrong numbers, at least, you know, you get the points, right? Sorry if I've got it wrong there. All right, let's go to the next point. Go to Song of Solomon chapter two. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 3. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 3. Again, we have the wife singing about her husband or to her husband. And it says here in Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 3, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Okay. Before I keep reading the rest of it, she's saying my husband is like this apple tree amongst all the other trees in the wood. Right? There's all these trees, probably with trees that you can't eat from, but you find that one apple tree in the middle of the woods. She says, that's like my husband. My husband, that fruitful tree, you know, amongst the sons, like the other sons of the nation, the other men. Right? She sees her husband as that, that fruit tree, that apple tree. And then she says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Okay, now think about this. If she's seeking to sit under the shadow of the apple tree, what is she saying? You know when it's a hot day, right? It's a hot day and uh, you, 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 know, you need a drink and you need to be refreshed. Quite often you look for shadow. You know, you, you, you know when you go door to door soul winning, I don't know about you. When you go door to door soul winning on a hot day, I'm kind of looking for some shade. I'm looking for somewhere that I can stand so the sun's not beating down on me, right? You're looking for shade because it gives you comfort. It gives you relief from the sun. And husbands, that's how you need to be to your wives. Your wife, your wife is looking for you for comfort. She's looking for, at you for security. She's looking at you for that protection, to know she's comforted. She has confidence in you as that apple tree providing shade for her. And she sits down there with great delight, with great delight. And so not only is she looking after uh, comfort from him, it then says that his fruit was sweet to my taste. So she eats from the, the productivity of her husband. If the husband's the fruit tree, she's eating from the fruit, the apple tree. She's eating of that apple, all right? And we can take this as a more literal interpretation if you want. But what she's saying is, you know, I rely on my husband for my daily needs. I rely on my husband for the provision as a family. And of course, this is an illustration of men going to work. Men going to work, you know, that's what the Bible commands of us. That's what's going to give you satisfaction in life. I've preached on this before. You go to work, you earn a paycheck. Why? To be rich? No, you earn a paycheck to provide for your family, provide for your wife, provide for your children, put a roof over their heads, give them clothing, give them food. And as your wife partakes of your provisions, she's able to sit there under the shade of that tree, as it were, and be provided for. Husbands, you need to be a provider. It's symbolic of, of, of the daily necessities of life. She's relying on the apple tree for shade and for food. And husbands, your wife needs to rely on you 
for, for the comforts and for the provisions in the family. So that's my next point. Please look at verse number four now. Look at verse number four. Verse number four. And this one's really, really important. I really, if, if you don't, if, if, if the other points go over your head, at least please focus on this point. Point number four. Point number four is honor your wife. Husbands, honor your wife publicly. Honor your wife publicly. Look what happens here. Verse number four. Chapter two, verse four. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. So, of course, this is King Solomon. He's got a house. He's got a place just for banquets. Just what's a banquet? A feast. You know, to put on a, a big party, to, to put on, you know, uh, to, to invite friends, to invite family and have a great time, right? He has this banqueting house. And, and it says here, she says about him, he brought me to the banqueting house. And it says, and his banner over me was love. What's a banner? A banner is a public display. Okay, and usually when you go to have a banquet, you're going for a reason. Maybe there's something to celebrate. Maybe you're honoring somebody, right? And here you see he's honoring his wife. The reason he's getting everybody to the banquet, now everyone's feasting and having a good time, is because he wants to publicly show everybody there his love for his wife. That's the banner over her, was his love at the banqueting house. You know what that speaks to me about? That means, means men, you need to praise your wife. You need to tell, tell people how good she is, how good of a wife she is. Speak well of your wives. You know, and it's a shame when, when men turn around and speak evil of their wives. It's a shame when wives turn around and speak evil of their husbands. You know, one reason that I, you know, I'm against women in the workplace is because I worked with a bunch of women. They'd come complaining about their husbands, whining about their husbands. You know, and, and, and just, just to look for another woman's shoulder to cry on. Oh, my husband's such a terrible man. My husband doesn't do this. My husband, look, that's the wrong approach. That's not the biblical approach. All right. What we should be striving to do is find the good qualities about our wives, find the good qualities about our husbands and make it a public display. You know, do people in this church know that you love your wife? Do people in this church know that you love your husband? Or do they look at your relationship and think, man, you know, that marriage needs a lot of help. You know, that man, you know, you know, this man, why doesn't he love his wife? You know, why doesn't he love his children? That's not how it should be. You know, in public, especially amongst the brethren, it should be obvious that you have a love, a public love. You honor your wife. You speak well of her. So that's point number eight or point number seven. I have lost track of my points now. Whatever it is, okay? Anyway, let's get to our next point. Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse five. Just the next verse. It says... She says, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. For I am sick of love. Now, when it says here that I am sick of love, she's not saying, oh man, I'm sick of this relationship. I'm sick of my husband. That's not what she means. When she says I am sick of love, she's saying I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. You know, and uh, it's a bit embarrassing to say, but I remember when I first met my wife, when I met Christina, you know, my, my, my parents took me to Chile for a holiday. And my dad would say, oh, he's just thinking about Christina all the time. You know, I, you know, I'm on holidays. I'm overseas, you know, with my family that I don't see very often. And it's like, oh, man, he keeps thinking about Christina. You know, he keeps wanting to email Christina. You know, back then I had to go to one of those internet cafe booths to send her an email. You know what I'm talking about? You know, before mobile phones and stuff. You know, and my dad was like, why? You know, he's always thinking about Christina. I, I was lovesick, all right? I was lovesick. And uh, you see, this is a married couple, and they're still lovesick. They're still sick of love, right? They're still in, in that way. And when, when, when you're lovesick, you're going to be able to oversee the faults of one another. You're going to desire to have that passion, the, the love, the affection toward one another. You know, the, the little things that we all have faults, we all have little habits that we, we don't like about each other. But when you're in that state, you can oversee all of that. And you just want to spend time together. She said there at the beginning of verse number five, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples. Point, the next point that I have here was spend time together. She wants to spend time with him. She says, stay with me. You know, uh, comfort me with your apples, she says. And look at verse number six. His left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. So there, you know, there's a physical affection there, right? She, she's, uh, she, she's, 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 she's longing for, uh, for him to be there physically for her. She's, she's looking to spend time together. And uh, we need to keep this in mind. And men, men, I'm talking to husbands because just because I'm a man, so I know how we think, right? 
We go to work. We go to work for eight hours, nine hours, ten hours, whatever it is. You come home and you've had a hard day at work and you just want to be left alone, right? You just want to be like, oh man, I just want to get home and you know, just have something to eat and, and go to bed early or something like that. But if your wife's been at home, if your wife's been looking after the kids, she's looking for some you know, time with another adult, right? She's spent all day looking after the kids or maybe homeschooling the kids, whatever, whatever's going on. She's looking forward to spending time with you. And husbands, you need to remember that. You need to remember that when you come home, spend some time with your wife. You know, force yourself. Say, you know what? Yes, I've got other things to do. I've got other things, but I'm going to spend the next half an hour. We're just going to set that aside, wife. That's you, you and me time. You know, kids, go to your bedrooms. Go read a book. You know, I'm going to spend some time with, with wife. I'm going to spend some time with mom uh, today. So please, point number nine or point number eight, I'm losing track. Spend time together. Spend time together. The next point that I've got for you, if you can please go to chapter one, Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 17. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse 17. As I've been going through this series on the family, when I spoke about the, 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 what gives men satisfaction, I talked about how we need to get out there and work, right? And when we work, we provide for the family, right? I mean, that, that's going to fulfill your desire as a man when you're doing that, when you're able to provide for the family. But what if you provided for your family and your wife never appreciated what you gave to her? Man, how would you feel about that? How would you feel if your wife never gave you, never said, you know what? Thanks for working a hard day this week. Thank you for making sure there's enough money coming into the household to provide for the family. Thank you for making sure that the bills are paid for, that there's a roof over our heads. Look how the wife responds here in verse number 17. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 17. She says, The beams of our house are cedar, and our rafters of fir. Fir is an evergreen tree. So she looks at the house that they live in, and she compliments the house. She goes, you know what, the beams of the house are cedar, that's an expensive wood, and the rafters are full. She goes, well, we've got a roof over our heads. You know, what is she doing? She's thanking her husband for providing a place to live. That's what she's doing. She's complimenting, look, you've, you, you, you know, you've provided for me. You've provided my need. And so the next point that I have here for the wives is appreciate your husband's provision. Your husband's provision. Again, he's out there for eight, nine, ten hours working with people. He probably doesn't even like all that much, right? But he knows he has to do it to get the paycheck. He knows he has to do it to, to provide for the family. And why is it, if you turn around and say, oh man, I, I wish we had a bigger house. I wish we had a newer car. You know, what, your husband's going to feel like he's not been a, a, a good husband. He's not going to feel that he's been able to fulfill his part, his role in life. You know, look at what your husband has provided for and be thankful. I'm sure you've eaten today. I'm sure you've been clothed today. I'm sure you've been able to, I hope you've been able to pay your bills, right? And if you've been able to do that as a married couple, most likely it's because the husband went out there and worked the job. Worked out there and made sure his family was provided for. So make sure you appreciate, you tell your husband how much you appreciate the hard work he does for the family, okay? Please go to chapter 3, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. So my next point that I've got here, well, let's read it first. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. Again, the wife is speaking here. She says, or singing here, she goes, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Now, this is interesting about his bed. Now, remember, Solomon's the king of Israel. He's a very wealthy, a very powerful man. Okay, so as you read this, I'm not, well, let's read it. Three score, what's a score? 20. What's three score? Three times 20. 60. Okay, three score. 60 valiant men are about it of the valiance of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. The next point that I have here for husbands is protect your wife. Protect your wife. Give her security. Okay? Now, how did Solomon give his wife security? He had 60 men of war, probably the best soldiers he had about the bedroom, just guarding the place. Okay? Why? For fear in the night. You know, as the king, like, I'm not saying, guys, go hire 60 bodyguards right, every night around your house to make sure your wife is protected. Of course, we can't do that. Right? I can't afford that. All right? But what, obviously, as the king of Israel, he can afford this. And with that kind of position, 
Of course there would have been assassination attempts. Of course there would have been attempts to kidnap his wife, kidnap his family, you know, to uh, ransom for money, or the enemies just wanted to come in and destroy the figurehead. And so what Solomon had prepared was these 60 bodyguards just around the place, around the bed, around the bedroom to make sure he could sleep peacefully, his wife could sleep peacefully. So we take the lesson, we take the application there, and men, we need to provide protection for our wives. You know, men, you're probably taller than your wife, you're probably broader, you're probably stronger, most likely you are, genetically you would be. In general, men obviously are much more stronger than, than ladies, right? And there's a reason for that, all right? It's because when your wife screams in the middle of the night, you're not required to scream also. In the middle of the night when your wife screams and you hear some noise in the house, men, you get up and you find out what's going on. You get that pole under your bed, you get that baseball bat, whatever you've got, and you're like, oh, what's that noise? Where's that coming from? You get ready. Man, I wish we could own guns in Australia. That would be the right thing to do. Protect your family. You know, have a weapon. This guy had 60 bodyguards, all with swords, ready to go. Ready to slay the intruder. Ready to, to slay the assassin. Men, we need to be strong. Physically strong, yes. But also uh, mentally strong. And yes, I know when you hear those funny noises in the night, you've got a bit of fear as well. But don't show your wife you've got the fear. You're, you're trying to give her security, right? She's thinking, oh, my husband will take care of it. If you're like, oh, I don't know, honey, let's lock the door. Let's, let's lock the door, make sure no one... But what are the kids in the other bedrooms? You've got to look after the kids too, right? You know, get out that baseball bat and just risk your life for your family. If you're safe, you're going to heaven anyway if you lose your life. Praise God for that, right? I mean, it will just get better for you, right? So, you know, don't have fear. You know, uh, you need to make sure you, you protect your wife. And... Um, you know, it, this can be a, a variety of ways, you know, looking after your wife in that sense, making sure, you know, when we, we bought a house in Bonnerig, we got shutters for the windows. Because in Bonnerig, it's one of the highest like, uh, places that people, uh, of robberies and people breaking into houses. So to give my wife comfort, we got some shutters on the windows back then and, and some screen doors, you know, to just give protection. Some people might put cameras. I don't know. I, I don't really want the cameras, but some people will put cameras. Whatever it takes to give your wife security, you need to be thinking about that as well. Okay, your wife is looking for security, especially in the night. All right, let's go to the next point. Uh, verse number 11, chapter 3, verse 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. <clears throat> now, let's uh, We'll read this slowly. It says, Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion. Again, the wife is speaking. And behold, King Solomon with the crown so obviously he's the king right so he's got crowns but he's got a specific crown here king solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him look at this in the day of his espousals what's a spouse that's your married partner right that's your husband or your wife and so king solomon's wearing this crown the crown that his mother gave him on the day of his marriage all right let's keep going and in the day of the gladness of his heart. All right. Now, I don't have a crown of my spouses, but I've got a wedding ring of my spouses, right? I've got my wedding ring. And so, husbands, if you've got a wedding ring, make sure you put it on. All right. When you get out there, you put it on. And it's, it's more than that. You know, now, you know, that ring sometimes gets a bit small for me as I put on weight and I get a bit thick or whatever. And sometimes I get it enlarged. You know what? I don't like wearing my wedding ring. Like at home, I'll put it on my bedside table. That's a bad thing because a lot of the kids get in there, they, they mess things up and we lose it for a while. But usually at home, I don't have my wedding ring on. But when I get out of the house, I always put it on. Why? Because if a woman sees me, I want her to know, hey, I'm married. I'm taken. All right? And this will remind me as well. If you have any impure thoughts, any stupid thoughts in your... Oh, hold on. There's my wedding ring. All right? There it is. And I made sure I put it on for this sermon to make sure... Here it is. The, you know, the crown of my spousals. Right? There it is. That's how we need to be. We need to remember the day of our marriage. Remember our wedding day. You know, point number 12 or 11, I don't know. Rejoice and celebrate your wedding anniversary. Rejoice and celebrate your wedding anniversary. Look what it said there at the end of it. And David's espousals in the day of the gladness of his heart. When you got married, that should have been a day of gladness in your heart. It's worth remembering. King Solomon, how does he remember? He puts on the crown. He goes, hey, that's the crown I got married in. You know, the day of my spousals. He puts it on. You know, we need to celebrate our wedding anniversaries. You know, celebrate. You know, use whatever symbols you have. You know, go back and look at those wedding photos. If you've got the wedding photos, you've got the wedding video, go back and celebrate. You know, kids love looking at that kind of stuff. 
You know, my kids never get tired of looking at our wedding photos or looking at our wedding video. You know, show the kids about the, you know, the day when they went there, you know, the day of, of the espousal. And, uh, you know, um, I, 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 just, I just remember one story. I'll tell you one quick story. When I was at work and I had a colleague and she had a later shift than I did. And she comes into work and she's all frustrated and upset. And I'm like, you know, are you all right? What's up? You know, she goes, oh, you know, we had a, I had a fight with my husband. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she goes, oh, you know, it's our wedding, it's our wedding anniversary today. And he's angry at me because she was working a late shift. He's angry at me because I didn't take the day off. You know, we didn't make any plans for our wedding anniversary. And she's like, oh, you know, my husband, whatever. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the, this is the greatest day of your life. This is a day that should have given you the most joy. And I said to her, look, go home, go celebrate your wedding anniversary. I'll cover your shift. <laughs> I'll cover your shift. I'll stay back. I was ready there earlier than her. I'll, I'll stay back. You go home and you celebrate your wedding anniversary. It's, in, it's an important day, men. Ladies, remember that day, that day of gladness in your hearts. That's going to give you the springtime marriage. Every year you go back and remember, hey, that day we got married. Remember that day. Remember the adventures, how difficult. All the diff- you know, every, every uh, marriage, every wedding also has its problems. Like right? People rush in last minute to organize things. So there's always little stories of, of, of marriages and stuff like that. You know, she came back the next day and said, oh, you know, thank you so much. We had a great time. You know, we went out and uh, we celebrated and things like that. Unfortunately for her, she's now divorced and remarried. But it doesn't surprise me to see her attitude toward marriage. You know, her attitude toward her anniversary. You know, I don't want to see you divorced. I don't want to see that happen to you. And part of that is to make sure that our marriages stay in springtime. And part of that is remembering our wedding anniversaries. Please make a big deal out of it. Please take the time off work. Take the time off work. Save up some money, all right? Take your wife out. You know, work out something else with the kids. Or bring your kids with you, whatever. But make sure you have a great time of celebration on your wedding anniversaries. I've got two more points, and then we'll, we'll conclude this. Two more points. Please go to chapter 5, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. The next point that I have here for a springtime marriage is make your spouse your best friend husbands and wives wives your husband should be your best friend husbands your wives should be your best friend you know when you have something you need to get off your chest you shouldn't be thinking oh, i've got to call my mate you know what's yeah you know what's 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 uh, what's john up to you know no no you when you got something heavy in your heart you got something you need to talk to about you need to go to your spouse you need to make them your friend look at verse 16 song of solomon chapter 5 verse 16 this is the wife speaking again and she's speaking to other women. So, oh, she's gossiping to the other women. Well, let's see what she says. She says to the other women, his mouth, speaking of her husband, his mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. Is she gossiping about her family? Is she gossiping about her husband to all the ladies in church? No, she goes to the ladies in church and goes, my husband's the best. In fact, he's my friend. He's my best friend, oh, ye daughters of Jerusalem. You know, we need to make sure that in our marriage, we maintain friendship, husbands and wives. Things that are on your heart, things that are on your mind, you take them to your spouse. That's part of the reason of getting married, is you've got someone, you've got that one flesh, that person that belongs to you, that can help you, that can hear you out. You know, husbands, when you're down, your wife can lift you up. Wives, when you're down, your husband should be there to lift you up. It's not about finding your best friend from high school or anything like that. No, your best friend needs to be your husband or your wife. Call him your friend. That's going to make sure that you maintain that springtime marriage. Now, my last point, please go to chapter 8. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. I'll, read, I'll, I'll tell you what the last point is and then we'll read it. My last point that I've got here is in order for us to have a springtime marriage is be jealous of your spouse. Be jealous of your spouse. Okay. Now, we don't, in this day and age, we don't understand the word jealousy. Okay. We think of the word jealousy as a negative term. Okay. If I said I'm jealous of so-and-so, then why, why is that? You know, you know, people would think, oh, you know, you want what they've got. That's not how the Bible uses jealousy. You know, the God that we worship is a jealous God and he says his name is jealous jealousy 
is, is protecting that which belongs to you. You know, I'm jealous for my children. I don't want my children being taken away and raised by someone else. I don't want my children spending hours with some, someone else rather than the parents. I'm jealous for that. I'm jealous for that, right? And look at this, Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart. He said, look, it's been said to the spouse, you know, put a seal about your heart. Make sure that there's a continual love there, that you wouldn't look at another person. This is just between husband and wife. As a seal upon thine arm. Look at this. For love is strong as death. Look at this. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. How jealous should, be, should you be for your spouse? With like coals of fire which have the most vehement flame. There should be this flame in your relationship. A godly jealousy in your marriage. Let's keep reading verse number 7. What about this flame? Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would, be, it would utterly be contemned. Verse number 7 again. Many waters cannot quench love. Do you see how the Bible puts love and jealousy together? The jealousy as those coals of fire, that vehement flame. No matter how much water you throw onto it, it can't burn out. That's how your love ought to be for one another. That's how you ought to be jealous for one another. What do you mean? How, what, what do you think I would say if Christina, now this has never happened, but if Christina comes to me one day, you know, says, oh, you know what, one of my, one of, one of the, one of my friends from high school uh, uh, is on the Sunshine Coast. And he's asked me out for a coffee. It's a hymn. Oh, it's one of your good friends from high school. Oh, yeah, go for it, honey. Is that what I'm going to say? Just go for it, honey. Go spend time with some other man. No. You know, if I hear something like that, you know what's going to happen? The vehement flame's going to come out. The jealousy is going to come out. And say, honey, you're married to me. Let's go out for coffee, you and I instead. How about that? How do you think my wife would feel if some woman kept flirting with me, giving me attention? constantly talking to me how do you think my wife would feel she wouldn't like it oh honey come on you know you no, no no that's jealousy you know jealousy is a positive attribute to what belongs to you husbands your wife belongs to you wives your husbands belong to you when you feel jealous when there's the opposite sex is giving a you know attention too much attention to your spouse and you're feeling oh, you know good feel jealous Pull your husband out of that situation. Yes, do it. Because this is what the Bible instructs us to do. We need to be jealous for that which belongs to us. We're not talking about envy. We're not talking about covetousness. When you, when you covet, when you envy other people, you're desiring that which doesn't belong to you. But jealousy in the Bible is desiring that which belongs to you. The reason God is a jealous God is because the praise and worship of God's people belongs to Him. And he doesn't want that praise and worship going to some false god. And so he says, I'm a jealous god. That praise belongs to him. Husbands, your wife belongs to you. Wives, your husband belongs to you. Not to another woman, not to another man. Okay? And so those are my points. I'm going to read them again very quickly. Uh, and I won't number them. But num uh, number, won't number them. Show physical affection. Smell good. Compliment her appearance. Buy her jewelry. Have a faithful marriage bed. Provide for your wife. Honor your wife publicly, spend time together, appreciate your husband's provision, protect your wife, rejoice and celebrate your wedding anniversary, make your spouse your best friend, and be jealous for your spouse. You know, those are, those are a few points there that will make sure you have a springtime marriage. Now, in conclusion, please go to Song of Solomon chapter 2. In conclusion, Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10. And I'm just going to leave you with this thought. How is your marriage today? Brethren, how is your marriage today? Could you say to me honestly, before God, and you don't have to tell me, but, you know, yes, I have a springtime marriage. You know, it, it's, it's springtime in my marriage all the time. If, if that's true, praise God for that. Praise God, you know. And I hope I've given you some extra things that you can be thinking about. Maybe you can apply to your marriage if they've dropped off a little bit, okay. But, you know, some marriages are more like summertime, where it's hot and heated. You know, husbands and wife clashing arguing, fighting with one another. We don't want the summertime marriage. It's very uncomfortable in the heat. Okay? We don't want the autumn time marriage when the leaves are falling off the trees. 
You know, the, the marriage is on a downward spiral. That's not what your marriage should be. It shouldn't be getting colder and colder and, and what was once there starting to you know, dwindle away. You know, not, not, you know, shouldn't be wanting, you shouldn't be comfortable in an autumn time marriage. You shouldn't be comfortable in a winter time marriage either. When it's cold, when it's wet, right? Winter, when it's ice cold, no communication between the two of you. You know, you live in the same house, but there's no relationship, there's no friendship. It's ice cold. That's a winter time marriage. You don't want that, okay? You need to be thinking about the springtime marriage. Look at verse number 10. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. And you see, if you do have one of these other seasons in your marriage, summer, winter, or autumn, you wouldn't be the first couple to have that. In fact, in this song, this couple had that as well. Look at verse number 10. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. So he says, you know what, honey? I'm sick of winter. It's past. Let's put it behind us. Let's have a springtime marriage. You see, this song started in winter, and now it's over. And now they're aiming for that springtime marriage. You know, in order for you to develop this into your marriage, you have to put the effort in. You have to tell your love, rise up, my fair one, and come away. Let's change this about our marriage. Let's put some things in place to make sure we're having our springtime marriage. Verse number 12. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Now, that's, turtle, that's a turtle dove. Okay. Verse number 13. The fig tree put forth her green figs, and the vines with a tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Husbands, you're the head of your house. How's your marriage? Is it a springtime marriage? If it's not a springtime marriage, you know what you have to do? You have to grab your wife by the hand and say, let's come away. Let's get out of this situation. Let's aim for a springtime marriage. Let's put that rain, let's put that winter behind us and let's start having that springtime marriage. And so, how do I do this? How do I put these steps into place? How do I, you know, people say, I just don't know if I love my wife anymore. I just don't know if I have the love anymore for my husband. You know, how do you, how do you get that love back? You know, one thing that I've learned in life, um, a lot of people think that they will be good husbands and good wives as long as the love is there. But you know what it is? What I realized is you've got to put the work in. You've got to take these points and put them into your marriage. And once you've put them into your marriage, then the love will grow. I'll give you an example of this. When I was in, in high school, one of my friends uh, like gave me, he went on holidays for a couple of weeks, and he left me his pet bird. You know, it was like a, I think it was a peach face love bird or something. Uh, just a a tame, tame bird in the cage. And he said, look, can you look after my bird? Okay. I didn't care for the bird. I had my own bird. Right? But I, I didn't care for the bird. You know? and I said, of course, I'll take care of it. But obviously, when I had the bird, you've got to make sure it's got food. You know, the bird gets hungry, you've got to make sure it's got its seeds. You've got to make sure it's got fresh water every day because it gets dirty. You know, you've got to pull out the tray with the, with the paper because it poops all, you know, on, on the paper at the bottom. So you've got to replace that paper and put new paper in there. And because it was a tame bird, it wanted attention. It wanted a, a bit of affection. So I put my, my hand in, in, the, in the cage and the bird would jump in my hand. And, you know, it'd want to be there with an adult. It'd want to be with a human being because it's tame. It's been tamed from that from birth, right? And so it'd be there. And after a few days, it's like, oh, it's a great bird, you know? Start patting it, you know? You, you want to feed it, you know? You want to take it out of the cage, you spend more time with that bird. Look, I did not start with love for the bird. You know what happened? I started to grow in love for that bird, you know? And then when my brother, when my, sorry, my friend came back from, from his holidays, he's like, oh, can you return the bird? I'm like, I don't want to return the bird. <laughs> I don't want to, I mean, of course I returned it, but I didn't want to. Why? Because I developed a love. I developed a bit of a relationship with that bird. You know what I did? All I did was, I did the work. I made sure there was food, I made sure there was water, I made sure it was clean, I made sure it got some interaction with a human being. You know what you need to do if you say I, the love is gone? Well, the love will come back, but you need to do the work first. You need to put these things in place, these points that are brought forth in the sermon. You say, I don't have the love, just do it. This is what God commands you to do. He's given you the Song of Solomon for a reason, so you can take these principles and apply it to your marriage. Once you start applying it to your marriage, guess what? You're going to start loving one another again. It's natural because you're taking care of it. You're spending time. You're putting energy into it. You're spending you know, mental energy. Uh, you know, you're praying about that. And when you spend that time and you start to see these things come, come together, you're going to grow love for it. You wanna, wanna, you, you're going to want it to be successful. You're going to want your marriage to be in springtime. 
That's what you do. You don't wait for the love to come back. You just start doing what God says and you start doing what God says and the love will return naturally, organically. That's what you're seeking for. So I hope, you, hope this has given you some good points, um, you know, husbands and wives. I don't have a perfect marriage. I can look at some of these things and say, look, I can improve in these things. And I think we all can. You know, the years go by, we tend to forget the things we used to look forward to, the things we used to do as newly married couples. So uh, I just pray that each one of us would seek to have a springtime marriage. Let's pray.